Hello Mathies, Gatos here. In this video we will cover exponential functions. So let's get started. I want to talk to you about the characteristics of an exponential function. What makes something an exponential function? And that is if the variable is the exponent. So just because you have an exponent doesn't mean it's an exponential function. The function has to have a variable exponent like this. So here is an exponential function, y equals a times b to the x. Now a is your initial amount because it's not tied to an x value, it's actually the y-intercept. b is a constant, it's your base, your multiplication factor, and x, the exponent, is your variable. Now let's talk about the base of an exponential function. It has to be positive. It has to be positive and it can't be 0 or it can't be 1. So altogether we say that the base is greater than 0 but can't equal to 1. Let's look at why that is. Why can't the base be 0? So imagine if I had 0 to the exponent of x. What would that look like? If I plugged in all sorts of values of x, I would just get 0 with the exception of 0. 0 to, z to the power of 0 is undefined it is an error. But 0 to any other power that is positive will give you a y value of 0. So if you were to graph that starting but not including at 0 and going to the right I would have a horizontal line. I have no line on this graph because that would be the reciprocal and you can't divide by 0. So this is not an exponential graph, it's actually a linear graph. Why can't the base be 1? Well, for a very similar reason, if I were to have 1 to the exponent of x and I put in any value of x, I would just get 1 because 1 to any power will always just be 1. If I looked at that graph, I would not get an exponential graph. Again, I would get a linear graph because this is a horizontal line. So that's why the base can't be 0 or 1. But why can't the base be negative? So imagine, for example, that you had something like negative 2 to the exponent of x. So there my base is negative. Well, what would happen for various values of x? First of all, if I look, I notice that I start to alternate between positives and negatives. If x is an even number, I raise it to itself an even number of times. Let's look at what happens. So all of these are even numbers. Notice for each one of those, the y value is positive because when you multiply a negative by itself an even number of times, you get a positive value. But if that exponent was an odd number, as in the ones that I, oh, I forgot about zero, as in the ones that I didn't circle, you can see if I take a negative number and multiply it by itself an odd number of times, I'm always going to get a negative value. So I'm not going to have a connected graph. I'm going to be always bouncing between positive, negative, positive, negative. If you actually put this in your graphing calculator, your graphing calculator can't graph it because it's not a connected graph. So if I were just to graph those points, it would look something like this. So because that is not a connected continuous graph, it is not allowed. So now you see why the base can't be 0, 1, or a negative value. Now let's look at the difference between a base that's greater than 1 and a base that's between 0 and 1. So in this example here, I chose three numbers greater than 1, a base of 4, a base of 2, and a base of 3 halves, which is 1.5. All of those bases are greater than 1. So if you look at all of those graphs, they all look pretty similar except some are steeper than others. So they all have very common characteristics. Let's talk about the domain, for example. In Math 30-1, we look for three things for domain. Am I dividing by zero? Am I square rooting a negative? Am I logging a negative? If it's not one of those things and it's not a word problem, I have no restrictions on my domain. So exponential functions, no exception. You can have any value of x for your exponent. Let's look at the range. Notice the range is all of the y values are in quadrant 1 and 2 where y is positive. And actually, you can see it looks like they're getting really close. It almost looks like they're on the x-axis, but they truly aren't. You cannot take 
4 and raise it to any exponent and have it equal exactly 0. Same thing for 2 to the x. It will never equal exactly 0. It will get really, really close to 0, really, really small number, but never truly reach it. So we actually have a horizontal asymptote at y equal to 0, and therefore our range is everything above 0, so greater than 0 or from 0 to positive infinity. Because y can never equal 0, I do not have an x-intercept. I notice that all those graphs have a common y-intercept at 0 and 1. That is the initial amount. Now, to determine the last point, am I increasing or decreasing? To know that, I am going to read the graph from left to right, and I'm going to focus on what's happening with y. So as I read these graphs from left to right, I see that y is getting bigger. For each one of these graphs, y is getting bigger. So since y is getting bigger, I can say that this is an increasing graph. So when the base is greater than 0, those are all of its properties, and I have increasing graphs. Let's look now what happens when I have a base between 0 and 1. So for each one of these, I chose 2 thirds, so that's like 0.6 repeating. This is 0 0.5, 0 0.25. So those are all numbers between 0 and 1. So they look very similar to the graphs that we just talked about. For many of these properties, I just see one big difference. Let's go through them. Domain, still the same. No restrictions on my exponent. My range, I still see I have that horizontal asymptote at y equal to 0, which means everything is above 0. Because it can't truly equal 0, I do not have an x-intercept. I see they all have something in common, and that's my y-intercept at 0 and 1. But these graphs do not look like the other graphs. Let's look at the increasing decreasing. Again, I read the graph from left to right. So starting at left, as I get x be bigger and bigger and bigger, I see y is getting smaller. Same thing on the blue graph, getting smaller. Same thing on the red graph, getting smaller. So what is different here is that these graphs are all decreasing. So they have the same domain, range, x-intercept, y-intercept, asymptotes, but when the base is greater than 0, I'm increasing. When the base is between 0 and 1, I am decreasing. Just to recap my little tip on telling if it's increasing or decreasing, read a graph like you read a book, a sentence, from left to right. If y is getting bigger, the graph is increasing. If y is getting smaller, the graph is decreasing. So now that we know some basic properties of exponential graphs, let's delve into a little bit more why is a base greater than 1 increasing, like 2, but a base in between 0 and 1, like a half, decreasing. So here I have the graph on the left of y equals 2x. On the right, I have the graph 1 half to the x. I can clearly see that this one here is increasing. The base greater than 1 is increasing. I can see here the base between 0 and 1 is decreasing. But why does that happen? To explain this, I want to write them with the same base. So I have a base of 2, and here I have the reciprocal of 2. So to write it as a base of 2, I'm going to take the reciprocal of the base, flip it to be 2 over 1, and then I can make my exponent negative. So I can use my negative exponent law. So 1 half to the x is the same as 2 to the negative 1 to the x. Just to even show you that they're the same, if I were to put that in the graph, I get the same graph. So if you look at 2 to the negative 1 to the x, you get the same graph as half to the exponent of x. Here, if I multiply these two together, negative 1 times x, I get negative x. Well, I know from my transformation units that 2 to the x and 2 to the negative x are the same graphs with a horizontal reflection. So that's why 1 is increasing, and then I do a horizontal reflection, and it now turns into a decreasing graph. Okay, so let's look at coming up with the equation ourselves. y equals a times b to the x. So I look at this graph here. I see it's increasing, so I suspect that my base is going to be greater than 1. I don't know what the number is yet, but I know it's going to be greater than 1. I see I have an initial value, a y-intercept, at 2. 
So I need to solve for my base and I will use the other point that it passes through to do that. So I'll substitute y for 6, a for 2, I don't know my base, but my x value is 1. So I have 6 equals 2 times b to the 1 is just b. I will divide both sides by 2 and I get base is 3, which yes, seems reasonable because the base is greater than 1. So my equation is y equals to a multiplied by b to the x, 3 to the x. Now let's take this format of y equals a times b to the x and look at it as it applies to word problems. So this is on your formula sheet. This is used for growth and decay or any type of a word problem. y equals a times b to the t over p. So we basically took our exponent of x and made it a little bit more specific. So a is still your initial value, your y-intercept. b is your base or multiplication factor. t is time, p is period, the time it takes to go through one cycle. Now a little tip to pay attention to, your units for time and period must always match. Now let's again focus on that base a little bit more. I want to look at a couple of ways that you might be able to see a base in a word problem. So here's some common bases and periods. So in the first one, example, a population is increased by 15% each year. So if it's increased, it's increased by the previous amount. So 100% of the previous amount plus an extra 15%. My base is 115%. We don't work with percents, we work with decimals, so it would be 1.15. And you can see increasing base greater than 1. The period is the amount of time it takes to increase, and that was each year, so my period is 1. Now in the next one I have a population, this time decreasing by 5%. So decreasing by the previous amount. So 100% of the previous amount less 5% is 95%. Again, we don't work with percents, we work with decimals, and I can see that my base is in between 0 and 1, so it is in fact decreasing. Period is the time it takes to go through one cycle, and that's each year, so the period is 1. Okay, another scenario I might have is where the population is just 80% of the previous year, so not increasing or decreasing, just 80% of, so the base is 80%, or as a decimal 0 0.8. So I can see that it's actually decreasing because my base is between 0 and 1. But it's from last year, so the period is 1. Okay, two more examples with bases here. Sometimes we talk about half-life and doubling time. So half-life means that the amount is getting cut in half. And the definition of half-life is the time it takes to get cut in half, and that is 12 years, which is my period. Here I have doubling time, that means times by 2, and doubling time is the time it takes an amount to double in quantity, and that is 20 days, so that is my period. Okay, let's put this together in one question, a word problem. So in this word problem here, we have the number of bacteria in a petri dish is increasing at a rate of 90% per hour. Write an equation to model this situation. So first thing, I heard it was increasing, so I know that my base will be greater than 1. So since it's greater than 1, it's 100% plus the growth rate. So my base will be 100% plus, it's growing 90% per hour, so that means that my base is 190%, or as a decimal, 1.90. And I can see, yes, my base is greater than 0. Now, A is your initial amount. It didn't talk about how many bacteria there are. So I know I am starting with all of the bacteria, however many that is. So my A value is 1. So my equation will be Y equals A times B to the T, T for time, divided by period. Now, it's increasing per hour, so my period is 1. So I can tidy this up a little bit here. I can just have y equals 1 times anything is itself, 1.90 to the t. t over 1 is just t. Okay, let's use this equation to solve the next part. 
It says graph the function and determine how long it will take the bacteria population to reach 1,000. So in Y1, I would put in 1.90 to the T. In Y2, I would put my amount, which is 1,000, and I would want to find out where they intersect. So I can put that into my calculator and draw a little graph, use your little numbers on the side to help you with your window setting, and I can see the intersection point 10.76 uh, approximately and a thousand. So the big question comes, how should the answer be rounded? So there's a couple ways of rounding this depending on what the question asked. So I want to look at three common ways the question might ask you. So it might ask you how long to the nearest tenth of an hour. In that case I see 10.76, round it to the nearest tenth and I get 10.8. That's how I would answer. Sometimes the question will just say, what is the number of hours it will take to reach 1,000? Well, in that case, if I'm at 10.76, I'm in between 10 and 11. So you can see here at 10 hours, I have 613.11, and at 11 hours, I have 1164.9. So if I want to reach 1,000, I can't say it took 10 hours. I haven't reached it yet yet, I would have to round it up to 11. Even though it's more than 1,000, you want to err on the side of caution. And then the last thing it could ask you is, during which hour did I reach 1,000 bacteria? So it happened between the 10th and the 11th hour. So it's during the 10th hour. Sometime in the 10th hour before I reached the 11th hour, it reached 1,000. So that kind of gives you an idea of how to round. So this was your introduction to exponential functions and exponents. My question is, if they're exponents, when did they stop being ponents? Get it? Because they're exponents. So I hope this video helped you. If it did, please give it a thumbs up so I can help more mathies just like you. Hit subscribe, and I look forward to seeing you for the next one.